Yeah, th this is this is work which has started um, more than 15 years ago, and I thought it would be one project, but it somehow n never let me go. So let me tell you a little bit, a little tiny, some snippets of that story. Um, so on this is the uh, this was the headlines on uh, July 16, 1907, uh, which was really kept captivating the world. Uh, this is an ex example from the New York Times. Oh, let me do something I can share. Let's go this one to um, laser pointer so you can see a little bit. Yeah. So this was um, the news that a big literary find in Constantinople um, uh, was made by Johann Ludwig Heiberg, a Danish scholar. He had discovered in the Byzantine prayer book um, drawings and um, writings of the until that time, never seen copy of the great Archimedes of Syracuse. Um, and uh, the story about Archimedes, so let's see, how can I forward this slide? Oh, here we go. Archimedes, of course, um, uh, lived in uh, Syracuse, uh, which is part of the small town, which is now Sicily. It's a, it was part of Greece. And he had, um, uh, he had been famous in his, in his time. He's considered one of the three greatest mathematicians um, who, who ever lived. And um, the most famous um, event, um, which we all know about, even though it's historically not so well um, recorded, is uh, happened when King Hieros asked Archimedes uh, to, to tell him whether the crown, the wreath uh, his goldsmith had, had made uh, was really made out of pure gold or whether it might contain some lesser metals and, and the goldsmith might have stolen some of the gold which he had given him to make the wreath. And Archimedes uh, was the one who basically uh, was tasked with this difficult quest. Uh, and the story goes, while uh, uh, taking a bath, he actually found the solution. So what you need to know about the about a uh, wreath. I mean, if you want to determine the density, this, this, once you know the density, you can have a good estimate whether it's pure gold or not. Uh, you need to know the uh, weight, which is relatively easy to get, uh, but you also need to know the volume, which is incredibly difficult to measure because um, as you can see, it's a very complex object. And this is how um, uh, Archimedes' famous uh, Eureka moment came about. He was uh, taking a bath, and while he was taking a bath, uh, he had this idea. He said, "I know now how we can. I know now how we can exactly determine the volume of this object because <laughs> what he noted is when he was lowering himself into the bathtub, the water level was rising, and so basically it reflected exactly the displaced volume. So if you then, uh, if you know the, if you if you know the water the dimensions of your bathtub, you can." estimate the displaced volume. Once you have the volume, you can measure the, the density. And he was so excited about this that according to the legend, he jumped naked out of his bathtub and, and ran uh, a split naked through the streets of Syracuse. Um, here's how he could have done it, um, the experiment. Uh, you take basically the wreath and you take a clump of pure gold, which you know, you put them on a balance to make sure that their weight is exactly the same, so their mass is exactly the same. And if you dip them both in water and one of them goes up, uh, that one has to have a lower density, larger volume, because it is the water doesn't care so much about the mass in particular, it just gives it the, the so-called Archimedean force just by the size of the volume. And um, I, I should point out that Eureka has been such an important uh, uh, expression which we, we still use today. It is also um, it is also the motto of my home state of California, and of course that had to do with the with the gold rush in eighteen forty nine. Um, and we still commemorate. Basically, I would say we still commemorate Archimedes because our football team, the San Francisco 49ers, they have a pure golden. I guarantee you, it's made hundred percent out of gold. It's a pure golden helmet that they're wearing. Um, now, here is a depiction of Archimedes jumping out of his bathtub after the Eureka moment. And it's, it, at the, I found it at the University yeah. of Manchester. 
and it's terrible yeah. because um, it doesn't. I don't know who, the artist. I don't oh, know. What, okay, what fantastic. The um, are you at the back entrance? Oh, sh maybe we can. Okay, mute, can all right. Mute? I will come get you. Matthew, okay. Can, okay. can you mute Shauna? Maybe you can maybe mute everyone, and then I can unmute myself. Unmute myself. Thank you. Uh, you can hear me again, I suppose. Okay, so yeah, so I what I don't like about this one is um, I don't know why the artist decided to, to depict Archimedes without a beard. I'm, I'm sure he must have had one even bigger than one of Math of Matthew of Matt. Okay, so um the oh, so now I'm stuck. I need to stop sharing. Oh, maybe this this was the pr the problem with the um, muting everyone. So let me try that again. Okay, give me one second. Okay, so let's try this again. Let's share the screen. Okay, let's continue. Um, so one, one of the really important uh, discoveries of Archimedes is the law of the lever. And in fact, a lot of his science, a lot of his uh, mathematics um, was based on this. And let me just briefly uh, show you how he did it. It's really fascinating. Um, so imagine, and basically the law of the lever says, I mean, our children know it, of course, very well. It says that uh, um, a mass at, at A at distance A will balance a mass B at distance B if A times A equals B times B. And when you use the teeter totter as a child, you always know that the heavy, the heavy uh, uh, children need to move a little forward and the lighter one need to move a little backward to kind of make the, make the teeter totter go well. Um, Archimedes uh, really had a brilliant way of using um, his physical intuition to do mathematical um, proofs. And he, uh, in this particular case, he, ba he basically used this approach. He said, look, if I take two objects at equal mass at equal distance, they, of course, they will balance each other. Um, I can also take four objects, that's the same. I can put four in the middle or I can just place them all across. So here now I have six on each side and they will perfectly balance each other. Um, I, six is just an example, it could have been any number. And now he said, let me replace uh, these four uh, by one. And so this one will be sitting here. Uh, it will be sitting in the center of mass of those four objects, which is right here. So I just did that. Nothing will change. The balance will be intact. And now let me do the same with the other remaining 12. So I go to the 12. I count. I look where is the center of mass of those 12 objects. And I just place a big object right there. So I have, uh, I have kept the balance. I have kept the balance. And now all I have to do is count. I have to count where does the, the small one sit and where does the big one sit. The small one sits at a distance of six units and the big one sits at a distance of two units. And that is the law of the lever. And he did it uh, and he actually then generalized it for infinite many number of little cuts. Uh, and it impressed him so much that he actually came up to this, uh, the, the, there is this famous expression, Give me where to stand and I will move the earth. Uh, and this is, a, this is one of the uh, post stamps where you can see uh, commemorating this uh, expression by Archimedes. Now, um, he, um, Archimedes uh, lived, of course, uh, BC and, and he wrote his theories on papyrus scrolls. So here you have like a, a depiction of how it could have looked like. And um, succeeding generations then copied his work onto other scrolls and uh, in the fourth, about um, the fourth century, scribes be, uh, kind of a, a revolution in terms of um, how, how you um, how you communicate information, and they started using um, parchment, which is a which is an animal skin uh, rather than papyrus, and they started also not using rolls anymore, but they create started to make what, what we now call a book. Uh, so they used this parchment, they used many leaves, put them to bound them together into a book. And so you could, you could uh, get more information. And 
And they, and importantly, they use kind of an iron gall ink, um, which is, um, which kind of etches itself into the, into the parchment. And that was really critical. Um, the, the use of that iron gall ink was really critical for our, for the fact that we could actually contribute to this project and I'll come to it in a, in a minute. Um, and then uh, what we believe happened, I mean, he wrote three, there are three uh, uh, treatises known of, of Archimedes. Uh, two of them uh, have been lost forever, but we know them through copies, um, uh, codices, we call them three codices. And the, the third codex, which is this one, uh, which Heiberg discovered in 1907, also known as Codex C, that is believed to be a 10th century copy. So someone in the 10th cent century created this copy of Archimedes' work, and it, it only survived until today because uh, it was in the 13th century, it had been partly erased and overwritten and turned into a prayer book and was then um, safe in a, in, in a place where it basically didn't, uh, where it wasn't destroyed and where, where, was, where it wasn't deemed uh, uh, useless. And in a sense, I, ironically, this um, idea of palimpsesting, which means palimpsest means scraped again, and I'll show you how it works, is really what saved, uh, what saved the Archimedes uh, work, right? And so here is the um, idea of how this was done, this palimpsesting. So remember, um, I mean, these books were incredibly, I mean, in, insanely expensive. For one book, you have to kill a whole flock of sheep, skin them, dry the skin, cut them, discard all the ones which didn't go well, right? And it, I mean, it took, took weeks and I mean, it took months and years to grow the sheep and then it took probably weeks to make them. So it is understandable that it, the, the more valuable uh, part was not always used, uh, considered the content, but really the medium in this case. So the, so the parchment book. And that's why this, this idea of palimpsesting was such a popular uh, thing to do. And there are tens of thousands of palimpsests out there right now. Um, so you first uh, uh, disbound, disbind the book and then you um, use some, maybe lemon juice, you can use some wine, you can use some even milk. Uh, uh, our, my colleague Abigail Quan, she's an expert, she studies how this is done. And you kind of wash off the existing uh, writings uh, and then you often cut the, the original uh, uh, big leaf into two. Uh, you'd rotate it by... 90 degrees, and then you actually override it at a right angle to the original one. Not all of them are done like this, but many of them, uh, many palimpsests are done like this, and then you rebind it into the book. And that's, and what we are of course interested in this case is not this text on top, but we are interested in these two columns of text below. And that of course also goes, if you have a folio like this, it goes uh, across. So why was this Archimedes palimpsest so incredibly important and why did it make the headlines in 1907? Uh, Heiberg found three treatises of Archimedes which were previously unknown. One is the original Greek version of On Floating Bodies. That's the famous Eureka moment, if you want. Um, and two, uh, one is called the Stomachion, which is a phenomenal uh, game of um, how to put uh, different triangles into a square. And it's a game of combinatoric. It's brilliant. And um, uh, supercomputers have now actually confirmed Archimedes' way because he calculated how many possibilities there are to do that. You can read about it and, and find out more about it. And then the third one, probably the most remarkable, called the method of mechanical theorems. It's a form of, uh, it's a form of uh, integral calculus. And Archimedes used his uh, concept of the law of the lever to create, uh, to create this uh, calculus. Uh, some scientists believe that if, if the, the um, Renaissance would have known about it um, before, let's say, Leibniz, and then before um, Newton came up with real integral calculus, it could have even have advanced science in the, in the Renaissance and in the, in, the, in the late Middle Ages even faster. Um, that, than it has because it was it is such a powerful it's such a powerful method um, and 
Uh, so this book um, was believed to have been lost after World War I uh, when Constantinople was sacked and it resurfaced in maybe in the 70s then more concretely in the 90s in France and on, in, on October 28, 1998 was sold to a private collector uh, for $2 million at Christie's in New York and the collector reported a pledge to not limit access to an ancient uh, manuscript. Um, and he was contacted then by the owner, uh, he was contacted uh, by the Walters Art Museum, uh, and he has agreed uh, to lend the manuscript for an integrated effort of conservation and imaging. And this was all in the, uh, in the basically beginning of 2000, and my colleagues, several of my colleagues with whom I'm still very good friends, have done some unbelievable work of using multispectral imaging, um, um, visible light and, and also UV multispectral imaging to enhance the contrast between the top layer text, uh, which you're not interested in, and the Archimedes text. But there were also problems uh, in several pages where, where even the best optical method just didn't work. And uh, this is one example, page one and page two of the Archimedes Palmses. You can read hardly anything the page is burned and it's also full of mold and whatever little writing you see is all from the uh, Byzantine monk and it's not Archimedes writing. Archimedes writing would be uh, in two columns in, in the vertical direction. And then they found four uh, interesting pages with miniatures on them, which turned out to be forgeries, um, folio 21, folio 81, and they contain uh, this one depicts the evangelist St. Luke, and it, underneath it contains on floating bodies. Uh, this one depicts St. Mark, and underneath it contains text from on floating bodies, equilibrium of planes. And then most importantly, this bifolio, so this was originally one big leaf, uh, which contains, um, so St. Matthew and St. John are the evangelicals, which are depicted here, and underneath text of uh, method of mechanical theorems, the most important text discovered. And um, it is, and the, 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 whoever did these, whoever did these um, um, forgeries uh, was the person who had the book at the time, was running out of money and needed, quick, uh, needed a quick way. It had to do also with uh, Nazis getting power in Germany, needed to get a quick way out and thought by putting on these forgeries, he could make this book um, become more valuable to, to a collector and then be able to, to sell it. So that's what we now think about it. This, this, these forgeries happened in the 1930s. Um, and, um, and so now um, I'm going to come to x-rays and you, of course, in this audience, I don't have to introduce x-rays very much. Uh, we are using x-ray fluorescence for this uh, because the x-ray, regular x-ray transmission, the contrast would be too weak. And the concept of X-ray fluorescence is, of course, that you, you knock out an inner shell electron, right? Uh, and you fill it uh, from, uh, let's say, most often the 2p level, uh, if it's a 1s electron, and out comes the fluorescence. In this case, that would be called the K-alpha fluorescence. And then you can also have fluorescence lines from outer shells, K-beta, et cetera. And this, this idea of using X-ray fluorescence um, is, is not new. Um, here, I just show you briefly uh, this is a typical spectrum, an X-ray fluorescence spectrum taken uh, uh, of the Archimedes palimpsest, um, and you uh, have energy here. I, I didn't, I, I didn't write the names, but these are, let's say, at, uh, five. You know, this is four kV, uh, this is six, seven kV, etc. So we have phosphorus. You can see, you can see chlorine. You, see, you can see the K-alpha, K-beta uh, line of of, of uh, calcium, iron. Uh, this is iron k beta copper and zinc and um, in fact it was uh, costa and nishina in 1925 who first suggested to use this type of um, x-ray method on the quantitative chemical analysis by the means of x-ray spectrum in in this beautiful paper and um and it is very powerful you can you can see minute traces uh, um, of any element with this X-ray fluorescence method. But what the challenge was for us um, was to do it fast. And I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, here, all of you are familiar in, in, in this, all, all in this audience are very familiar 
with the workings of a synchrotron. I just want to remind you, synchrotrons are really old. They have been around for a long time. Here's the first one. Uh, this goes back almost 3,000 years. And you can see the, uh, the hard X-ray hutches here. And then here, there's some soft X-ray hutches. That they, they, they don't have a hutch. They, they don't need uh, protection. Uh, or you can see the latest synchrotron. Anyone recognize the latest synchrotron? Um, I, this is, yeah, so I, I'll let you know because this is, um, this is via Zoom. So this is actually not a synchrotron. This is the new uh, Apple building in, in uh, close to where I live. So I think I'm probably somewhere here back in the, in the back. So, but I mean, I have to say this building, I mean, if, if this building is really phenomenally beautiful and it could be, it could be exactly a synchrotron. It looks exactly like a synchrotron. <clears throat> this is ours, the, the, the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Lab. It usually doesn't look as great. It looks like an old abandoned warehouse, but uh, this, this artist made a, good job, made a good job of making it look really in its most beautiful way. So um, we used Beamline 6.2 and we are still using that Beamline. Uh, now we are starting to move um, and um, it has, an, it's a, has a wiggler. It has, you know, the usual optics. And the important thing is we don't, I uh, use a super tight focus. We use a collimator slit and a pinhole because what we want is a, a pencil-like beam. Uh, and the reason why we want a pencil-like beam is because the, the, often these objects like the palimpsest are not flat. So you don't want to, when, when you scan it, it'll, it'll have different depths, different distances from the pinhole. And you, you don't want to move out of focus uh, while, during the scan. So that, that was one challenge. The second challenge is, as you can imagine, if you want to get a high resolution image of one of those pages, it could take you something like 5 million pixels, right? That's really what the scholars want. And so you need to do 5 million XRF spectra. You have to collect a 5 million XRF spectra. So you have to come up with a way to do it really fast. This is um, a depiction, uh, an animation. And in reality, actually, we are moving almost at that kind of speed now. Um, and so uh, you can do the math, how long it takes you. You have only a few milliseconds per pixel uh, so that you can get in, in some hours, in something like five hours or so, you can scan one of those pages. And that was really a lot. We spent a lot of work in improving that. And Sam Webb uh, and Nick Edwards at SSIL now have taken over and they, they have some really beautiful instruments there to do XRF imaging. <clears throat> Here you see Abigail putting in the uh, first page into the hutch. And now let me show you a few pictures and then we'll do a little break. So this was um, uh, 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 the first page of the Archimedes palimpsest, And this is the iron XRF image. And it was really phenomenal. When we got it out, it was a phenomenal success. And um, the, the scholar, Reville Nets, he's a professor at Stanford. He's, he's one of the three scholars of this project, he sent out an email at, at, at 12.30 a.m., so half past midnight, uh, and he said, thank you, Keith, Keith, Keith Not Knox had sent him the, the pictures. Thank you for the images. Uh, one V means first page. Page one verso, column one, is sensational. I attached the transcript of uh, this. Previously, I could only squeeze out a half, three and a half lines but now I can fairly easily read effectively the entire text, noting a couple of errors too in my old pseudocolor read. <clears throat> we also, on that first page, we were also able to discover uh, the so-called colophon. This is where the, the author of the um, prayer book tells the date, uh, the name, and the purpose of that book, right? It's kind of the book dedication at the beginning. And um, it took a little bit, but then the scholars deciphered this text here means this was written by the hand of Presbyter Johannes Myronas on the 14th day of the month of April, a Saturday of the year 6737. That is the Byzantine calendar. And the year 6737 basically uh, starts with the, with the creation of the, of the earth or with the creation of the world. Uh, and day one, basically. So, so the, this is day one in, in, the, in that belief. And the 14th, uh, this corresponds to, year, to the year 1229 in our uh, calendar, which the Gregorian calendar, which we use now. <clears throat> and the 14th day of the month of April, 
a Saturday was, of course, and we are approaching this day this year, this was the day before Easter. And um, we, we can only imagine that the poor Johannes Myronas, like we do when we have to submit a paper or a grant, was struggling all night, working all night to get his prayer book uh, uh, ready for the Easter sermon. Um, what's remarkable is uh, if you compare this day uh, with this day, it's it, almost to the day. I mean, within one month to the day, it was 777 years before someone could look underneath what Johannes Myronas had been, had been writing. And here's an exa another example. I go, just go briefly through those. This is the diagram from the method. Uh, and this is the XRF image, which kind of, in this case, the calcium brought out the really high quality image. Um, and that was really phenomenal because we could find, we could see a drawing, an Archimedes drawing, and then uh, again, correct some of the mistakes from previous images. And then here now, this was a major success. These are one of those forgery pages and you can look what the XRF images bring you. They, you can see the text. I mean, you can see the clear writings from both sides. Uh, you can see them actually from the back side and from the front side. We image this through the back side, so we avoid these heavy metals in the forgery. Uh, so the X-rays could penetrate in and out. At one point, we also uh, used two detectors and my colleague uh, Revel Nets used and uh, developed an algorithm so we could digitally separate the front side and the back side. So here's an example. So you take a detector from the back, detector from the front, you compare uh, the signal, uh, you compare the signals and you can come up with a way which tells you that this has to be from the front side, this has to be from the back side to an approximation and that helps you to separate out these uh, texts. <clears throat> um, this whole work was published um, in, in several papers, but, but most importantly in these two, in this series of two big books, um, uh, which are really, I mean, enormous books. I, ha I have them at home. Um, and, um, and also there was a very popular book, um, uh, which has been translated into more than hundred languages called the Archimedes Codex. It's really a fun book to read. And I'm going to give you one little quote from this book, uh, and then I'll open it up for some questions. Uh, this is my colleague. William Knoll, uh, who is one of the authors of this Archimedes Coded book. He was the, the leader of this project, a very dear friend of mine and has been part of, of all these experiments. Here he, here he enters uh, SSL Beamline 62. It didn't look like a professional setup. Inside the hutch, the guts of the machinery were scattered all over the place. Outside the hutch looked like an electronics junkyard. <laughs> welcome, welcome to, welcome to the room. But then he continued, and I was really proud of that. But I soon realized that this is precisely what serious professional operations look like, because looks don't matter. And essentially, new machines were tailor-made for different operations every day in this extraordinary place. So with that one, I'm going to uh, open it for uh, maybe a few minutes of questions. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, Uwe. That's a great quote. I think that should be on every hutch wall. But that's, um, yeah. <laughs> It's wonderful. I, that's a great story. I think Matthew Marcus has a question. Matthew, do you want to? Uh... Yes, I was wondering uh, what, uh, how you image the two, uh, the two writings separately, the Archimedes and the prayer book. Yeah, what that, this, used? yeah, that one we could not do. So uh, we tried. But you somehow got the colophon, which is the prayer book, and, and the Archimedes. Yes. So, so the way how the scholars separated is because they are written at a 90 degrees angle. So let me go just back for a second. Um, so here you can see it. The, you can see that the, um, the, the prayer book is on this depiction is vertical and the right. Archimedes is horizontal. And so when you zoom in, um, you, can, um, you, you can actually read it this, even though um, you have sometimes text on top, right? And you can see here yeah. because it's kind of additive. Um, right. we, tried, we were thinking whether we can separate it by uh, spectroscopy. So we looked at the spectra, but they all look basically that's all iron. Uh, it has all been turned into iron three, right? So there was no um, um, spectroscopic separation between those inks. So we had to, the scholars had to rely on just the fact that there was, they were one was uh, vertical okay. to the other one. Yeah. So I guess uh, both authors used iron gall ink 
That's right. Both used iron gall ink and the iron in both inks, um, even the composition of the iron was the same. I'm going to give you in a minute, I'm going to give you an example where the composition was different of the top and the bottom text. And there we could separate them out, actually. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks. So Peter, Peter Boyce, you also have a question? Um, yeah, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, recently, I've been reading up on uh, women in on the history of women in sciences, and I was wondering if you've ever come across a treatise by Hypatia. And um, no, not yet. But if you, if we, uh, you know, uh, if if there is a palimpsest of it, uh, we can. Uh, if you know something about it, let me know. Not at all. I'm a geochemist, so I, I'm not in that field, but it's something yeah, okay. I'm really curious about. Yeah, and... yeah we, we are always interested in, in, very, in, in these like, objects, and we have a few in the pipeline right now, but I'm always interested to, to learn if such, a, if such a thing exists and, and if it's also palimpsest. Remember, we, we are not scholars. We, don't, we are not interested in just reading these texts. We are interested in imaging them and bringing out texts which are hidden. Right? And so one has to first establish, are there some potentially hidden ones? And then, and then, it, beca then it becomes more interesting. For us. If something like that exists, I will be incredibly interested in it. Yes. Thank you. So, Thank you. So, Uwe, can, I, can I ask um, for, um, what were the uh, spatial resolutions or the spatial pixel yeah, size so that for, you used for these? Yeah, and what was yeah so for this one, that? we used, uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Matthew. Uh, so Matt, uh, for this one, we used uh, 50 micron. And for some of the larger ones, which I'm going to show you in a minute, we actually 100 micron is enough. And then sometimes you have to go even smaller, right? Ah, but ah. you remember it goes, I mean, you lose time very quickly, right? If you go from sure. 100 to 50, it's already factor, to, factor four in scanning time. And then depending on how many photons you have, you might lose another factor two or so. So you all of a sudden it takes 10 times longer, right? And if you have to do a mass production, right? You, you, you cannot afford... To, uh, so we basically decided on the resolution together with the scholars. Yeah. Okay, great. I, actually, so Yang Ha also asked, also has a question. I'm just going to paraphrase it because it goes right to the, a follow up to that. And, uh, are there more other other modern setups that can speed up this process? Yeah. So so uh, I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we, what we have done. So okay, yeah. great. Okay. Um, so why don't we? Uh, why don't we then continue? We'll add, and there might be more questions from this. Excellent. Going on. So yeah. please continue. Th thank you. So now, so now, so this was, yeah, so we, so now this was the next project and this was brought to, an, to us by um, a, a young, uh, a graduate student from Germany, Heiko Kuhlmann. He contacted the, he contacted the Stanford library because the Stanford library is in possession of this, um, uh, of an original score by the Italian composer Luigi Cherubini. He, were, he um, is famous for some of his operas. In fact, Beethoven, Beethoven once said that he's the, the best composer of Europe. And of course, everyone knows that Beethoven didn't think that, but, but Beethoven might have thought maybe, that maybe Cherubini was the second best or something. But anyway, um, uh, uh, he wrote this opera, Medea, uh, which is a really fantastic work. Uh, um, and it, and they found in the Stanford Library that there was uh, one part of the area du trouble affreux, which he had um, erased with shoe polish. I mean, they, they didn't know it was, whether it was Carabino, but most people think it was Carabino. So the, a section of this area had been erased. And they asked us, uh, Heiko Kuhlmann asked us, can we, can we maybe bring that, to, bring that back to light? And so we did some tests and we just, got, we just went down to campus uh, uh, and, and got it and mounted it and, 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 and Sam Webb kind of scanned it overnight. And here we were able to, um, we, we were able to actually bring, bring that work back to light. Um, and then uh, it was also published. Uh, first they put a postcard uh, to, to the 250th uh, anniversary of Carabini. And they also most importantly included it in the complete edition of Carabini. And now, since then, this was 2012, since then, every performance of the opera media, so here's, an, here's a modern version of media, uh, is performed with this, with this edition. And it, and it is this part here, uh, uh, in, in here, which has it. If you want, I can show you, uh, play you a few seconds of that area. I just found one 
Uh, if you look at all the previous ones, like with colors, etc., the media area is about four and a half minutes or four minutes. And the newer ones, they are five and a half minutes. So there's a minute and a half added from the text, which we were able to depict. Uh, let me let me save that for the end if we have a few minutes. I have the I have the YouTube video ready to go for that for that part. It's a it's really a it's a really a beautiful opera and, th and this is very very dark. I mean, it's basically I mean it's an old it's a very very old story. Media it's about you know mothers and children and and death and all, and all, and all the big the themes. Um, the, we were also contacted a little bit later on uh, from um, uh, some colleague. Uh, who uh, from the Chicago era, who has possession of what they were believing was a Quran palimpsest. So basically, you have a a, a, a copy of the word uh, of Quran text, and then underneath there was an, a different version, and it has in this case it was written not at ninety degree angle, but it, at in parallel. And so we we got this one leaf, uh, and it turned out first we were very skeptical. We thought that cannot be. That might not be really a, a, a true one, but that might be a forgery. But but we actually confirmed with carbon dating uh, that this was actually a, an original one from the time uh, of the Prophet Muhammad. And um, there were these. You can see this is the text on top, and then you can see an indication of the text below. And in this particular case, we were lucky because we we found out that the two inks had a different composition. The bottom ink had uh, had copper, twice the amount of copper, and it also had zinc. The top ink didn't have zinc. And that was a blessing because it was otherwise would have been different to separate them. So if you look at the iron XRF, you don't really, it's a mess. But if you look at the zinc, you can basically digitally remove the top layer and you can read the bottom layer. And, the, and my colleague, um, Bechnam Sadegi, uh, he wrote a paper about this. Um, and we actually found that uh, this was a different version um, than the Uthmanic tradition of the Quran. And it was, and, and in the history, those versions have been known um, that we, we know it is part of um, a, a book, which um, most of it is, in, is actually in Yemen. And there's another folio of that uh, in, uh, in England. And so this was published in the journal Arabic. And now let me uh, go to a little bit uh, update on our instruments. So we were um, uh, happy to get a, a, a friend of ours, um, Bruce League and his wife Sandra um, um, Ferron. They made a gift to to, to Stanford um, to um, for us to build a new instrument, a rapid scanning instrument. Uh, Bruce himself is a is a silicon uh, former Silicon Valley uh, uh, leader and uh, very interested in also in fossils and in fo and we have done a lot of imaging and fossils. And, and so he, he actually uh, sponsored us a wonderful new instrument. And I have to give all the credit to uh, Sam Webb and Nick Edwards who actually put it together. So um, this instrument now has a, a, a more modern detector. You probably know this, it's a four element. We have faster readout. Um, we, can, we can count up to one and a half million counts per pixel. So we can count a signal up to about six million counts. We have uh, we have different we have a setup where we can switch the pinhole size very rapidly from from one sample to the other. Um, it's a much better scanning stage. I didn't show that here, but uh, it's a it's a much faster scanning stage. That I can, and most importantly, we read out now. In the old days, we only uh, used um, six uh, t 12 channels. Now we read out all the four four thousand ninety six channels for each pixel. So it's it's a massive file. But but the new the new software and hardware can actually handle that, and that instrument is now on on six two, and there's another one very similar to that on Beamline ten two at SSRL, and we used it um, um, most recently for this project called uh, the Syriac Galen Palimpsest, and this is an this is from another really um, giant of antiquity. Uh, his name is Galen or Ale, Aelius Galenus um, uh, of Pergamon. And he was arguably the most accomplished of all the medical researchers of antiquity. Uh, he influenced the development of various scientific disciplines, including anatomy, physiology, pathology, pharmacology, and neurology, as well as philosophy and logic, speaking about 
uh, multidisciplinary uh, talents. And, and he was also the doctor at the, uh, at the Olympic Games when the athletes hurt themselves and, and then he fixed up the, the athletes. Um, there was in St. Catherine's Monastery, uh, this is the beautiful St. Catherine Monastery in the sign, on the Sinai. They cataloged a find in 1975, which they believe is, was the catalog of this palimpsest. So um, the work of Galen was written in Greek and, um, the, and it, was, it is also very popular in the, in the Arab world. And um, it is believed that the transmission from the original Greek version to the, to the Arab version went through, um, you know, through um, the, the area where they speak uh, Aramaic. And Syriac is an Aramaic dialect, which first appeared in the first century and was very, very common between the fourth and eighth centuries in the Middle East. And so, um, Having, having this translation from Greek into Syriac and having translations from Syriac into, into Arab directly and then comparing them, you can get a sense of how this information from Greece flowed uh, eastward. And that's the significance. And that's why scholars are really interested in this palimpsest. And uh, we are part of this project. We imaged 50, more than 50 pages of this palimpsest with XRF. It is more difficult than the Archimedes palimpsest in the following sense, also written at 90 degrees, much less, much better erased. So the palimpsestors did a better job, more difficult for us. And they also bleached the parchment. Uh, so they, they, I'll show you that in a minute. They bleached the parchment, which makes it even harder. Uh, so it makes it a little bit more white and that makes it a little bit harder to image. So we went uh, to the, to the library with the original book and we took a handheld XRF to make sure it has iron gall ink in it. Uh, we were told it has it, but we wanted to be sure. And then I took this little, you see that Pelican case and I flew it uh, from, from Washington Dallas airport to San Francisco and then drove it up to Slack. Uh, I gave it to the Stanford library uh, uh, folks, uh, Kristen St. John, Mi Michelle Cornelis and Smith and David Brooke, and they took over. Uh, and, and let me show you what they did. It's really beautiful. First, it had to come here to be disbound so that it could, um, the leaves could be removed from the book so that they could be prepared for um, disbound the book by clipping the threads and, and taking out the, the choirs, the folded pieces of parchment, looking at each leaf, um, recording any damage that I saw, um, photographing, and um, put them in boxes and, and took them to slack and then I uh, trained all the, the scientists who would be handling the leaves so, so that they would know how to handle them safely and prevent any damage. So you can see here, I mean, much progress from the electronic junkyard of the times of our, the Archimedes palimpsest. We have a really beautiful system. You can, it takes literally one minute to click it in. Uh, I'll show you now a little video how these guys do it. And it's, it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a pro production now. We can, we put it in, we, we have uh, Sam and Nick have built this beautiful uh, software where you can see exactly where the beam hits the sample. You can choose the scan range you want to hit. You put in the scan range, you start the scan, you can choose the speed and everything. And from then on, everything goes automatically, right? We still sometimes use some old detectors for the backside, as you can see this one, but usually we have the big ones. And you can watch it live on outside. You can watch the scanning live coming out. You can choose your window and you can see whether it's good uh, and you can really give feedback uh, right away uh, to, to, the, to the work. So let me show you uh, what we found. And so th this is an example. And with that one, I will actually end, end my talk and have, we have time and maybe for a few more questions. So here's an example. Um, this, one, this is the text we are really interested in. You can just barely see a little bit of it. Um, and um, I'm going to zoom in now. Um, so this is, uh, again, so there is writing right here, and this is a visible light image. Um, that's when you look at it, let's say, with a, you know, with, a, with a magnifying glass with very good light. And this is what my colleagues were able to do with multispectral imaging. So they were able to enhance some of the writings, but, but there's other writings here which they were not able to see. 
when we first started to do the XRF and we only looked at the iron image, we got this enhancement. And you can see, you can see a hint of iron uh, image XRF uh, uh, text. And then my colleague from Manchester, his name is Bill Sellers. He's a professor at the University of Manchester. He's part of this project. He came up with a machine learning algorithm. He said, let's not just take, let's not just look at iron. Let's take a spectrum, a full spectrum of ink, which we don't want. So that would be the top ink here. Let's take a full spectrum of XRF signal where we know there is no ink, let's say it's somewhere here. And then let's take a spectrum of where we know there is the ink which we're interested in. And then we train the algorithm to enhance the differences between those three spectra. And when he did that, and he used a linear algorithm and he's now working on nonlinear ones. When he did that, he enhanced this image to this image. So we are now using not just XRF imaging, but we're using a combination of XRF imaging with advanced, uh, let's say, 4,096 channels, full spectra, and machine learning um, algorithms to optimize the image of this XRF. And I think, I, and I'm very happy, this is the direction which will really make a difference. And I can guarantee you there will be lots of texts which otherwise would have been thought lost, which one might be able to bring out uh, once, you, once you put all these tools together. <clears throat> uh, so, if you look at the whole one, here's like a low resolution version of the whole one. You can, you can see basically, you can see the entirely see the text, uh, the scale and text. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank all my collaborators. It has really been a fantastic journey uh, starting in 2004 uh, until now. Um, we are currently working on, we are going to get a Gutenberg Bible and we are going to get a Korean print from the same time because there, there are, there's interest to know whether the Korean uh, printing influence, maybe some of the European printing invented by Gutenberg. Um, and uh, I should acknowledge of my, of my many colleagues from Slack and Stanford, in particular in the last years, Nick Edwards and Sam Webb have done really, they have really taken over this, uh, these imaging beam lines. Also my colleagues at the library, David Brook and, and, and uh, Christian St. John's and the others. Um, the, this is the team of the Zurich Galen Palimpsest. There's a, a special edition coming out. Um, soon um, of, of this work, it's in a it's a whole book, it's a whole edition by itself. Uh, and then these are many of my colleagues from the uh, Archimedes Palimpsest, Will Noel, uh, Mick, Mike Toth. I'm still working with him, and the others. We will always be kind of. Uh, this was such an amazing event. We will always be kind of friends together. And um, and I will finish showing the three giants, right? And then um, um, giving you a few. Um, uh, impressions of the very first days uh, when a palimpsest made it to the electronic junkyard uh, called the <laughs> SSRL. And I, we just published a long paper at the Springer Handbook. The link was attached to this invitation for this talk. You can download it from my website, from my website at um, Wisconsin at the PDF. It's a really long article and it really summarizes all the work in the last 15 years. So thank you so much. Well, I, I think for everyone, let me thank you. Uwe, that was that was really wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that's some really great work and some really exciting use of synchrotron radiation for uh, what used to be unusual aspects or unusual applications. I, I think there are a few questions um, or one question that came up during the last time was uh, to discuss X-ray radiation damage of these. Is that a, a concern? What did you do? That sort of thing. Yes, so um, it, it has been a concern from the beginning, of course, and we put in, uh, we put in our homework before we were even able to ship the Archimedes Palimpsest to Slack. What we did is we put in some parchment which we got and we, in fact, we did that at a, at APS because APS has such a powerful has such a power. So we 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 had beam time at APS for some other spectroscopy experiments, and I I brought a few pieces of parchment. Uh, we focused the APS beam down to I forgot what the size was, but a but a, a really strong strong dose, 
and we exposed the parchment uh, to various doses and then we looked uh, under a microscope and we also got some help from a conservation scientist in Ottawa who actually looked at the fibers, uh, the collagen fibers in the parchment and, and looked whether that he could see any damage, right? And with that, we kind of established a dose uh, which is safe for the imaging. So I can tell you, as long as you do XRF scan, rapid scanning, where you only expose a few milliseconds, there's, there's really no concern. Once you start to do EXAFs, or EXAFs is even more difficult, but even Zanes, once you start to do Zane spectroscopy, you have to be really careful because as you know, the metals uh, and you, you might cause some coloration changes, et cetera. And so depending on the object you have, you need to, uh, one thing, I mean, one of the things you say, okay, let's immediately relax the beam size, right? Make the beam as large as you can, take as few photons as you can afford, right? Because for, for, for Zanes and for Exas, you don't need a small beam. Uh, you just go in an area which you know, uh, relax, the, relax the, the power, right? As much as you can, d decrease the dose as much as you can, do a few fast scans, see whether you can see any changes and, 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 and then take it that way. But, but absolutely, you have to be uh, serious about that. You have to be serious about your humidity in the hutch. You have to basically air condition your hutch to ideally 50%. That's what parchment likes. 30% uh, is fine, but you should not go below 30. And we all know hutches get very dry, in particular in the winter. Um, the, the, these instruments, these stations are not well air conditioned. Uh, you want to have temperature stability as well. So those are the those are the three things I would I would say need to be considered. Right. We also, yeah. by the way, we also stop. We have a shutter. We stop the beam when we turn around. So at the energy scan, a shutter is inserted. We move to the next line. The shutter is open, and we so we actually open the shutter when we are already moving. So right. we do not. Yeah. We never want to sit with a with a bright X ray beam on the sample. <clears throat> right. So, so for, I have a sort of a practical question for doing these the multiple folios, multiple pages, 50 or, or so, what's the, what's the prospect for doing, you know, large, you know, large volume throughput for these and uh, are there beam time considerations for that? How, yeah, you know, I, I mean, it's a, it, 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 it is a totally a limitation, right? And I mean, if someone can come up with a way to, you know, to even speed it up more. I mean, right now, I mean, obviously, um, I, I think actually that because we mechanically scan the sample, right? And right. so we, we have enough photons to do it even faster, but eventually there is a mechanical limit, how, in particular if it's a large object. So maybe the future will be to move the, I mean, to have a mirror, right, and move the beam. Mm -hmm. Because mirrors only have to move a few degrees and you can, you, the, the problem with mirrors, obviously, as you know, they are not very effective. X-ray mirrors are not very effective. So you lose so many photons to come in. But maybe, maybe there are cases in the future with enough brightness and, and good enough mirrors that you can change it around and say, okay, we just have the object sit there and, and the object doesn't move at all. And we do, we do all the scanning uh, with our X-ray optics. So that would be one idea, right? right. Right. I, I know that I know that quite a, or some number of museums are are now working on having X-ray XRF capabilities yes. in house. Do you know, like, are they working toward having the sensitivity to do this sort of analysis? Well, yeah, yeah. The, so Matt, that's a really. I mean, those are phenomenal. So Brooker sells you. I mean, Brooker has one you can actually mount on the painting. Right, and then it works its way around. Right, so it's, yeah, it has yeah. a detector and the source, and it's actually move, the detector and the source are moving together. So you don't move the painting. The, the, they all of them are good for low resolution. Right, so if you have a big painting, you need only let's say a half a millimeter resolution. They are great. Once you get to high resolution, um, they, they just cannot compete because the the yeah. um, source optics has to be very tight focus if you want to get small and. You can see the Archimedes palimpsest. You will be immediately out of focus, right? As right. soon as you uh, hit the first bump, you will lose your resolution. So, so yes, I mean, if you get a chance to get one of those commercial ones, get it. They are fantastic, right? And they're getting better every year, right? The right. sources are getting better, and I would use them. But they're still, I think, that what we did with the Galen palimpsest and also the Archimedes, we tried, by the way, 
the Archimedes palimpsest, one of my colleagues on the paper is Gene Hall. He actually originally proposed to do that one on an, on an EDAX scanner and mm -hmm. it was just not practical, right? That's why we went to the synchrotron clinic. That's still decades away <laughs> or some museum will get their own compact light source. Oh, they and have, for example, yeah. the Amsterdam Rijksmuseum has one. Uh, the, I think Getty in Los Angeles, many museums have now these scanners and they're, they're doing it more for kind of paintings, right? And in yeah, paintings right. also, you can sometimes even do transmission. You can do X-ray diffraction at the same time, right? Because you're interested in the pigments. So it's a slightly different objective, right? And for, for those, these, these uh, commercial XRF scanners are really phenomenal. Right, yeah.